Hello, this is Morel Bernard with the continuation of the story, Dracula. Last words were that I grasped his hand instinctively and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope you did. By the way, please subscribe to the channel Study Coach UK. Please subscribe and please share. Thank you very much. I will proceed with the story of Dracula. Good boy, said Dr. Van Heslin. Brave boy. Quincy is all man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, none of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear. I do but say what we may do, what we must do. But indeed, indeed, we cannot say what we shall do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various that until the moment we may not say. We shall all be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now, let us today put all our affairs in order. Let all things which touch and others dear to us and who on us depend be complete. For none of us can tell what or when or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate and as I have nothing else to do, I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth and be ready for whatever may come. Later, it is all done. My will is made and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something in her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new pain, which, however, making God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now, but it may be that she can see them again. They shall be ready. She's calling me. 11th October, evening. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this. As he says, he's hardly equal to the task. And he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have of late come to understand that sunrise and sunset are to her times of peculiar freedom, when her old self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset and last till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with a ray streaming above the horizon. At first there is a sort of negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. When, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly preceded only by a spell of warning silence. Tonight, when we met, she was somewhat constrained and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. 
I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself. Then, motioning her husband to sit beside her on the sofa, where she was half reclining, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close. Taking her husband's hand in hers began. We are all here together in freedom, for perhaps the last time. I know, dear. I know that you will always be with me to the end. This was to her husband, whose hand had, as we could see, tightened upon hers. In the morning, we go out upon our task, and God alone knows what may be in store for any of us. You are going to be so good to me as to take me with you. I know that all that brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman whose soul perhaps is lost. No, no, not not yet. But is, at any rate, at stake, you will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me, unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake. And though I know there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. What is that way? asked Van Heslin in a hoarse voice. What is that way which we must not, may not take? That I may die now, either by my own hand or that of another, before the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know, and you know, that were I once dead, you could and would set free my mortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's. Were death, or the fear of death, the only thing that stood in the way, I would not shrink to die here, now amidst the friends who love me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case, when there is hope before us and a bitter task to be done, is God's will. Therefore I, on my part, give up here the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark where may be the blackest things that the world or the neither world holds. We were all silent for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were wet and Harker's grew ashen grey. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming. She continued. This is what I can give into the hot pot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place, and with all seriousness. What will each of you give? Your lives, I know, she went on quickly. That is easy for brave men. Your lives are God's, and you can give them back to him. But what will you give to me? She looked again questioningly, but this time avoided her husband's face. Quincy seemed to understand. He nodded, and her face lit up. And I shall tell you plainly what I want, for there must be no doubtful matter in this connection between us now. You must promise me, one and all, even you, my beloved husband, that should the time come, You will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's, but it was low and strained. 
when you shall be convinced that I am so changed that it is better that I die than I may live. When I am thus dead in the flesh, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head, or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. He knelt down before her and, taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow who hasn't perhaps lived as a man should to win such a distinction. But I swear to you by all that I hold sacred and dear that, should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us. And I promise you too, that I shall make all certain. For if I am only doubtful, I should take it that the time has come. My true friend, was all she could say amid the fast-falling tears as bending over. She kissed his hand. I swear the same, my dear Madame Mina, said Van Heslin. And I, said Lord Goldman, each of them in turn kneeling to her to take the oath. I followed myself. Then her husband turned to her, one-eyed, and with a greenish pallor, which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair, and asked, And must I too make such a promise, O oh, my wife? You too, my dearest, she said, with infinite yearning of pity in her voice and eyes. You must not shrink. You are nearest and dearest, and all the world to me. Our souls are knit into one, for all life and all time. Think, dear, that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womenkind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any the more because those that they loved implore them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those whom they love, in such times of sore trial. And oh, my dear, if it is to be that I must meet death at any hand, let it be at the hand of my that loves me best. Dr. Van Eslin, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush and changed her phrase. To him who had best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life, that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again, I swear, came the professor's resonant voice, Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled, as with a sigh of relief she leaned back and said, And now, one word of warning, a warning which you must never forget. This time, if it ever come, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time, I myself might be, uh, nay, if the time ever comes, shall be leagued with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband's, taking his hand in hers. She held it over her heart and continued, You must read it over me some day. 
Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be sweet thought to all or some of us. You, my dearest, will I hope read it, for then it will be in your voice in my memory forever, come what may. But oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is afar off from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand, I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. Oh, my wife, must I read it? He said, before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said. And he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I? How could anyone tell of that strange scene, its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and with all its sweetness? Even a sceptic, who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional, would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorry lady, or heard the tender passion of her husband's voice as in tone so broken with emotion that often he had to pause. He read the simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. I... I cannot go on. Words and voice fail in me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it all was, bizarre as it may hereafter seem, even to us who felt its potent influence at the time, it comforted us much and the silence which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapsed from her freedom of soul, did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had read it. Jonathan's Harker Journal, 15 October, Havana. We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to the Paris the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here at about five o'clock. Lord Goldamin went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel, the Edesus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God, me knows well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal throughout the journey. She slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she's very wakeful and alert. And it has become a habit for Van Heslin to hypnotise her at such times. At first some effort was needed and he had to make many passes, but now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments to simply will and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first. Nothing. All is dark. And to the second. I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and corded strain and mast and yards creak. The wind is high. I can hear it in the shrouds, and the bow throws back the foam. 
it is evident that the Zarina Catherine is still at sea, hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Goldemain has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we started, and all to the same effect, that the Zarina Catherine had not been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agent should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if she were not reported so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early. Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul, and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Heston says that our chance will be to get to the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition, and so cannot leave the ship as he dare not change a man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid. He must remain in the box. If then we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy, for we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy, before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with officials or the seamen. Thank God. This is a country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16th October. Mina's report still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water. Darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time. And when we hear of the Zarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17th October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Goldenpin told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent abroad might contain something stolen from, from, from a friend of his, and got a half consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave him a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose on board the ship, and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. We have seen the agent, who was much impressed with Goldman's kindly manner to him, and we are satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Heslin and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Goldman and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon after fall into dust. In such case, there would be no evidence against us. In case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if we are not, we should stand or fall by our act. And perhaps some day... This very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent, 
We have arranged with certain official that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. October 24th. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Goldman. But only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking mast. Do you join me? Do you join me for the next video of Dracula? Join me for the next video of Dracula. I'll see you then. Okay.